Welcome back to the channels Tapa Alho Azul and Super Academico. Let us keep the reading of my book Phenomena. Today we will read the chapter 15. Don't forget to subscribe. Let's go. Chapter 15 I was flying over Australia. It was a fascinating view. It was a constant contrast between arid deserted lands and modern cities with aggressive buildings. That is probably why this country fascinates immigrants from all over the world when they get here. The trip took two hours. It was like lightning speedy compared to the 14-hour trip from Boston to Sydney. As I walked around the airport, I noticed it was not a lot different from the one in Sydney. It was as if that country had been planned to be like that. The very new world. Professor Art Mandison and a student at the University of Melbourne, Carla Franren, were waiting for me in the lobby. The two of them welcomed me as they would a celebrity. I was not sure, but I think they didn't know I was only a student. Welcome, Mr. Tamerson. He was a tall man who seemed very nervous, judging from his gestures. I tried to imagine him teaching a class. Joseph. Please. It is a pleasure to be here, he shook my hand with a rather artificial smile on his face. That is one of my most brilliant students, Carla. Dash. Frarin. She was blonde and had a tan face due to the hot sun. I would call her a Californian beauty. This was the closest I had ever gotten to Australia. That's right. How did you know that? Do you read minds too? I kept serious. No. I read a lot about you. You are the girl that saw the transposition of your parents. She got a little sad after he said that. When she was only 13, her parents suffered a car accident and she claimed to have seen two lights leave their bodies while they were at the hospital's ICU. Two years ago, when she was already in college majoring in parapsychology, she wrote an article describing this phenomenon. I got interested because, like it happened to me, such event changed her life all around. In my case, seeing Donnie on the TV screen and my interest for paranormal phenomena did it. I think her case was even worse. She didn't say goodbye to her parents like I did to Donnie. Excuse me I didn't mean to. That's okay. It is good to meet someone who understands how I felt. That's right. I do understand it. The professor. Well. Shall we get going now? You will have plenty time to chat on campus and later. On in the expedition. Everyone at the university wants to meet you. Really? We walked toward the car. It all seemed weird at first. It went even past the way they treated me. I wondered what he meant by the expedition. I'd soon find out. Yet, during the trip, something else popped into my head. Beautiful Carla was of a wearing shorts, and me I couldn't get my eyes off of her legs, worse yet, she wouldn't stop staring at me. What more was coming my way? When I arrived on campus, I noticed the first difference between our worlds. This one was brand new, like a toy waiting to be assembled. That was very different from the old buildings at the University of Frankfurt. Nevertheless, it was very tiny compared to Harvard's grandeur. They first showed me to my room and then introduced me to the other team members. They didn't let me rest till dusk. The change of time zones was killing me. It would be dawn Boston, at this point, and I'd be in bed. However, I they at least I allowed me to eat while they got to know me. You establish lots of connections between the feelings of the living and the spectres, in your book? Do you really believe that's true? Judging from his question, I could tell he was one of those who are more concerned with the physical aspect of parapsychology. Absolutely. I can't be 100% sure of anything. I can only theorize. Yet, our conscience, that which makes us feel either guilty or relieved while we are alive, remains and gets even stronger, because it is freed from the interferences of the parallel universe. I am talking about getting along with other members of society and how our personalities interact with that. You talk about feelings, however, at the same time, you seem to be so focused, so serious. Wouldn't that be a paradox? That girl was into psychology, obviously. I don't know. Maybe. I don't say anything in hopes to represent the supreme truth. I have no intent to be a know-it-all whatsoever. Those who read the book know what I went through. Sometimes I truly feel that all this ended up affecting my so-called normal feelings and behaviors. But I can still manage to be human. While they'd laugh and I took advantage of that and went back to eating. I felt like Celtic's player while I was sitting there being interviewed by everyone. I felt like a hero. Only Carla wouldn't ask me anything. I think that the fact that she'd already witnessed a phenomenon enabled her to be more observing. I'd eat and they'd ask. 
We were at a cafeteria. It was empty and I was the only one who was eating at that time. They were sitting around me. They all seemed to be below 25 years of age, but I felt 10 years more mature than them. They seemed to have studied my book prior to meeting me. You condemn man's self-ignorance. Don't you think we deserve credit for our search for knowledge? He sounded like a priest. For seeking knowledge, yes. But not for searching in the wrong place for too long. What do you mean? The answers are within us. However, we are all lead astray and wind up on the wrong path because of theories that flee from the core of the subject, mankind. All that questioning was beginning to get on my nerves when salvation finally popped in. It was Professor Mandison. He'd come to explain how our research was going to be conducted. And I had just finished eating. Good morning, everyone. In spite of his fragile looks, everybody seemed to respect him a lot. I decided to go with the flow. There were eight of us and I felt I was I was the one who knew the least about the object of our research. As some of you know, seven months ago, one of our anthropologists was living with an aboriginal tribe in the Northern Territory and witnessed, by accident, a ritual called Amarinija. According to what the aborigines said, it would be just a transposition, whereby the spirit the deceased person would be set free to go onto the other side. However, our anthropologist saw a yet larger phenomenon than that. He says he saw rings of fire opening up on space and lightning that seemed to have specific destinations, as if they were guided by remote control. It was also verified that he doesn't have any sort of paranormal powers like Carla and our friend American friend Joseph. My curiosity button had just been pressed. It really seemed to be a unique opportunity to all of us, since even ordinary people could see that alleged phenomenon. They allowed us to send eight people to observe the phenomenon and try to document it. The eight of you. They demanded that you were all young. That's why I cannot go along with you guys. Why, Professor? I don't know. Those were demands made by the chiefs of the tribe. Our anthropologist was only 22 years old. The team will have two leaders, John Abbott, he is a senior and is totally aware of what happened. He also knows the area to be visited very well. The other one will be Joseph Tamerson. He was regarded as the best parapsychologist in United States and has the power to see spirits. You are the key to our research, Joseph. You and Carla will be the ones who will be able to confirm the ghastly presence during the phenomenon. She would just look at me and smile. I didn't change my facial expression at any time, except when he said I was the best parapsychologist in the US. No one had ever told me I was. I had to travel halfway across the world in order to find out what people thought of me back home. He continued to explain it. I was very tired, but managed to pay the attention to him. And then, unfortunately, you will have to remain there with the tribe until somebody dies. He couldn't help laughing through one corner of his mouth. Therefore, you are all going to receive the report of the anthropologist that was there, so that you will not do anything that might seem insulting to them. Actually, I advise you all to write your own anthropological reports, in order to get along with them as well as to kill time. Observing is everything. He was right about that. Besides, I had observed something thing and needed to ask him about it. What happened to the young anthropologist? He should be here to tell us about what he saw. Professor Mandison looked at the senior student who would be co-leader of the team with me, John Abbott. The two of them looked very serious. I think neither one of them were expecting that question to be asked. He's living at the university sanatorium now. Everybody looked at one another. Carla glanced at me again, only now she seemed frightened. I got concerned, but didn't change my facial expression. Did he go crazy? Asked one of the students. Not exactly. It just seemed as if the phenomenon was way too overwhelming for him to handle. Right after he turned in his reports, he became somewhat unbalanced. He started to have nightmares and hallucinations, answered the professor. And I? That means he did go crazy. Everybody looked at me, thinking I was joking, but when they saw my serious facial expression, they realized I was not. Not everyone handles such phenomena as well as you, Joseph, said John Abbott, so to break the ice. I know that. That why I suggest we visit this anthropologist before we leave. I would hate to see any one of us go through the same situation. I agree. Said Carla. All right then. He is not in maximum security area yet, thus he can be visited. I will make an appointment for us to come in to see him then. Everybody looked quietly to the professor in order to show they agreed. 
For now, just return to your tasks. And Joseph, try to get some sleep. You look awful. Thank God someone noticed that. He looks great to me. Up to this day, I can't believe she actually said that in front of everyone. It had been a while since I blushed that much before. Everybody laughed, even the professor. Relax, Joe. She is like this with everybody, said John Abbott. In spite of his slight air of arrogance, he was mature enough be leader. As for me? Just call me Joseph, please. I wanted to change on the outside just as I had changed on the inside. Therefore, I started to prefer to be addressed by my full Christian name, Joseph. Already then. Everybody took off. I went back into my room. I could barely feel my due to being so tired. Yet, my mind wouldn't stop thinking about that phenomenon described by Professor Manderson and the reaction it caused on the poor anthropologist. I was anxious to see the phenomenon, but I realized the key lied in the hands of the man who saw it before, because he witnessed it in its natural state. If everyone could share such phenomena, human beings would coexist in a much more harmonic and peaceful way. I remembered Antonio's relaxed way of handling such things as well as my own. I wondered how far we could get. I was finally in my room. I thought I'd make up for ten hours of sleep my body was crying out for. Two days went by. We studied as a team all about the tribe we were going to live with shortly. The report was not very clear. The anthropologist must have already gone crazy prior to writing it. He talks about hunting and fishing, work assignments, relationships between men and women, festive rituals, the influence of civilization, and their connection with the supernatural, not as in the phenomenon described at the end, but as in the connection that all primitive cultures have with gods, nature and death. Actually, he didn't make any reference to that, but I myself believed in that connection as being the key to their casual way of handling paranormal phenomena. What they considered superstition, I saw as some sort of natural paranormality. As we'd make progress into our research, I started to get to know that distinguished group. I'd already noticed that they were hospitable with everyone, and not only me. Different from what I experienced in Germany, there was a certain familiarity between them and us Americans. John Abbott seemed to have leadership running in his veins. He was not authoritarian or strict, but everybody respected him, and he made a real effort to be and know that what they needed. I argued a lot with him, but we never affected each other's authority figure image. The shock between my experience and his natural leadership skills bared lots of fruits for everyone, because it enabled us both to learn faster and to spot and transpose obstacles more efficaciously. Carla Framren seemed very childish. She toyed around the whole time. She had an amazing ability to grasp and gather information while she observed certain events. But all that and vivacity couldn't fill in the void her parents' death left. She's been living with her aunt and uncle for the past eight years. However, every time the subject of family got mentioned, her happiness was overtaken by a subtle cloud of sadness that would not go unnoticed. I wished I'd get to know her a little better, although I must admit that her selfless way of handling me was a bit scary. I would have to find out what that was all about alone. The other five members of the team were mere aides who'd help us get from point A to point B, amongst them, we got a spectral photography expert, a psychologist, a physicist, a seismology technician, since the anthropologist's report pointed out that the ground shook during the event, and a doctor, who was studying psychology, just in case. They all had their assignments and gifts, but everyone would be led by Carla and I at the time of the event, and by John during the whole journey and stay there. At the end of the second day, we'd gathered enough information. We were curious and somewhat adapted to one another and therefore, propense to get along well. This would be intensified during the expedition, of course. But what we really wanted was to talk to the anthropologist. We needed to understand what exactly drove him crazy. That was the only way for us to be fully equipped to go on that adventurous journey. Professor Manderson came up to us at the library on one Wednesday afternoon and said, Good afternoon, everyone. About what I said regarding hospitality. Sorry for having made you wait, but I had difficulty trying to make an appointment with our anthropologist. In fact, I didn't make one. Why, Professor? Asked John. Well, it just that four days ago he. He tried to kill himself? Everybody looked at for me very seriously and then turned towards the professor again. That's right. How did you know? The information was restricted. Elementary deducting, Professor. He says he felt a great and enormous inner peace during the event. And since that was happening to a deceased person, he thought he would as well achieve that level by dying. As John's already said, not everybody is prepared to witness such phenomena. 
That's why he only went mad when he returned to civilization. He couldn't admit the possibility of living in such a disordered world while there was so much harmony and inner peace in the parallel universe. Besides, it was pretty reachable. He'd just have to die in order to make it there. Everybody looked at me very seriously with a certain expression of fear in the eyes. When did you figure all that out? Right after the first day went by you didn't contact us. He sounds right, professor, and that takes us back to the old ethical issue, should we or should we not reveal the existence of such things to humanity? Won't that keep them from wanting to continue to live? Said John. And there's one more thing to consider. The soul only finds comfort if it came into contact with the good things of life while it was incarnated. That's the connection I talk about in my book. Feelings remain forever. He made two mistakes at the same time. First of all, he would never find peace that way. Secondly, he'd spend the rest of his existence in the valley of the suicides regretting having killed himself, in case he had actually managed to kill himself. Everyone looked at me with both admiration and fear. Carla seemed to be the most concerned one. I do believe that will be no more visits, right professor? He replied, a little uncomfortable with my fast thinking. That's true, Joseph. They put him on some strong sleeping medication and he will have to start a new treatment now. And what about us? Asked the psychologist. I cannot recommend that you leave immediately. I would suggest you reviewed your goals before you come up with your decision as to whether or not you truly want to go on with this. No stepping back will be looked down as retaliation. Joseph, I've spoken to Harvard. They said you would not give up. What do you say? They are right. I won't give up. But I won't condemn anyone by dropping out. Everybody looked at each other showing some confusion in their eyes. You don't need to make that decision now. I booked your departure for a week from today. Between now and then, think about it. Now, if you excuse me. He leaves us alone. Carla and John looked at me. They seemed to be the only ones who were sure they wanted to stick with the program. Well, I am fed up with studying. I will get something to eat now. I think everybody needed that change of subject in order to decrease the tension. Then John said, Joseph is right. Let's switch environments. We will have the entire week ahead of us to think about it. I am in a mood for pizza. What about you guys? That was a unanimous decision. We went out to eat, but my mind wouldn't stop thinking about that poor guy in the hospice. Perhaps some things should be left out of the reach of man until he fully matures. After all, even I could have been affected by that. That evening a quite desired visitor, although inconvenient, came into my room, Carla. What are you doing here right now? At that point, she'd already come in and shut the door. I needed someone to talk to and I just knew it could only be you. I imagined what the subject would be. She was wearing a see-through white short nightgown that revealed her long well-shaped tan legs. That didn't seem to be the proper dress code for a symposium. What is this all about? I asked, trying to seem serious. Yet, that was a very hard thing to accomplish at that point. It is about what you said earlier on. You said the souls only feel comfortable when they live their lives to the fullest while incarnated. That's true. At least, that's how I feel. So? Do you think my parents are at peace? When I heard her question, a feeling of relief flashed through my head. Oh, certainly. The transposition you described is typical of peaceful souls, especially when they make a soft passage through time instead of an abrupt one. Besides, they managed to raise a pretty daughter. I'll bet they smiled at you in the moment of their passage. I would have seen that, up to this day I am not sure whether or not I regret having said that. Oh, Joseph, she kissed me so fast that I didn't even have time to say anything else. I simply gave in. As for the rest, Mother Nature took over from that point on, and I have to admit she did a very good job. One week later and we were all gathered at the library again. We would leave in the following morning and it was time for the team members to make their decision. At that point, everyone already knew about Carla and I. But one thing was right, the two of us and John would move forward, only the other five ones had to give their verdicts. Professor Mandison comes in. Good morning everyone. I hope you have come to a conclusion. The Fantastic Five looked at each other as if they were both awaiting and fearing one another's response. I am going, said the psychologist, with a certainty that was at the same time admirable and stupid to a certain degree. The truth is that if she was trying to self-assert, that was not the right moment to do that. Yet I would not judge anyone. I just hoped she wasn't misfortunate in her choosing. 
Very well, my dear Angela. And what about you guys? They looked at each other for a second and said as in a choir. We are going. The professor's smile was an authentic demonstration of his pride. But I could not help worrying about all of them. How would each one react? Will John and I be capable of helping them if things get out of hand? Carla sensed my concern and began to absorb it, but I think she wasn't mature enough to understand what was happening. I could only hope everything went well. Very well then. Prepare to leave tomorrow at 8 a.m. I trust you will do a good job. Good luck. I'll see you tomorrow right before you leave. The professor walks away. Everybody smiled very shyly but I remained serious. Carla looked at me and then kissed me on the cheek. I felt I had found an adoptive daughter instead of a girlfriend. Despite her intelligence and knowledge she seemed like a high school girl. I caught myself thinking of Rana. I felt a little guilty and even somewhat of a jerk but I couldn't help it. She was very different. I think Carla would be more of a match for Eddie due to his jokes and gaiety. However, I had nothing to lose at that point. Very well folks. Pack your suitcases. The Northern Territory awaits us and we have to be prepared for it. I guarantee you that will be a great adventure. John talked as if we were going to hunt zebras in an African safari. I didn't want to break his momentum, after all, we all needed to relax anyhow, I could hardly wait to see that phenomenon. I didn't know exactly what to expect from it, but the air was filled with expectation. I hope you have enjoyed this reading. Don't forget to subscribe to both channels and like and share the video. Bye.